87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92. Hi. By the way, no, I didn't do 92 push-ups. Good. I just thought it was kind of funny. Well, I just had a 67th birthday, and I reflected on that briefly, saying, like most people do at this age, how can I be healthier? How long will I live? And can I make those years accountable? Not just that I can walk around and so on, but enjoy, be here, be present. Well, it really comes down to one thing. How much time and effort will you invest in your health? Well, I invest in my health. The thing that I'm doing right now, call it exercise, is extremely important. And it's probably the one thing that most older people don't do at all. So I'd like to show you a few secrets about this. So 10 years ago, back a couple months, almost 10 years ago exactly, I was needing four blood transfusions to even be alive. Why was that? Because out of the blue, due to long-term chronic stress of running a medical practice and other things, and family deaths and so on, that it just got to be too much. I lost so much, I, my gut exploded into the worst Crohn's and ulcerated colitis Lawrence Memorial had ever seen, supposedly. That's in New London, Connecticut, where I was serviced, where I was treated. And it was doubtful that I was going to recover without them cutting away my nearly entire large intestine. That didn't happen. But why that didn't happen is because I invested myself in figuring out what do I need to do to get my health back in that situation? That question is still here. What do I need to do to get my health back, to maintain my health, to make, improve my health going forward? That's a big deal. That's my motivation. I wanna share that with you. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you now is something you've never seen before. I'm gonna show you via labs how important exercise is. We're gonna track a hormone called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor-1, which is really a substitute for growth hormone. And how you, in your hands, with your effort, can change that. And should you change that, it's gonna change so many other things. So we'll get to the labs. But what I wanna sum this up in saying this it's a miracle in your hand. This one thing that you can do, this reason, this motivation, this incentive, this demand for you to exercise. We'll get into which are the best and so on and so forth, but something is better than nothing. Perfect is just an obstacle to getting started. I want, to, I want you to engage yourself. I'm here to pitch you on you, but I'm gonna show you why this is truly a miracle in your hand. Oh, welcome back. I know it's been a while. All I can say is we've had projects and um, you get deep into a project and that's all you can do. Anyway, tonight we're gonna to talk about IGF. So insulin-like growth factor and growth hormone. It's probably the most important lab I ever take on anybody. And yeah, you can say, well, how can that be? What about, what about uh, insulin? What about glucose? What about all those other things you've talked about an omega-3 panel and so on? All of those are important, and I'll tie in this to all of those. But if there was one lab that I ask you to take, I'll say, go get this, you know, give me your age and gender and where you live in the world and so on, but basically just age and gender, and go get this lab fasting and tell me what it is. And I will tell you basically how sick you are or how healthy you are, how much vitality you have, regardless of your age. So there's a lot of magic, if you will, a lot of secrecy, a lot of relevance, a lot of importance to IGF, insulin-like growth factor one, okay? And we'll get into it. We're gonna, this is gonna be the overriding understanding of IGF. I'm actually gonna break it into, perish the thought, another four or five videos to go deeper on certain components. Initially, I thought I'd whip this out because I've talked about this oh, about a year or so ago, and I did a, a video on it, and that was fine, and it was, it was good, it was pretty in-depth, but as I returned over a lot of this, now that I have labs of my own of uh, 60 to 100 people, I put together a spreadsheet, but from there I did a lot of scatter plots, and so suddenly I got to see the relationship of IGF, 
dash one, we're just going to call it IGF from now on, IGF relative to all these other things in the things that block it, the things that enhance it, and the problems that have if you don't have it high enough. And it's also something that you have direct control over. You don't have to buy anything, but you do have to understand what you're doing and take some action in your own life. Primarily, it's gonna be about exercise, but it's gonna be a few other things that you can do that will dramatically affect this level in your life, regardless of where you are, from zero to 90 to 110. I have had no patients who are 110, so I can't speak to that group. In fact, I'm, the highest is the highest, higher 80s. So there you go. Within that group, that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, so here we go. IGF, the number one hormone that will change your life, I kid you not, and it's free. What you need to do and what you need to know. Exaggeration or reality? You'll be the one to choose, but you'll be well informed on the other side. Most people think the trouble with getting older is that we lose our muscles. We lose muscle mass, which is sarcopenia, and that's true for a lot of people. We lose our minds, dementia and Alzheimer's, and that's true for a lot of people. And these rates of both these things have been going up. And that we lose our health, chronic diseases in particular. So you have, I could have thrown in osteoporosis as well, but all of these things are pretty much stereotypic of getting older. I don't think that has to be. I don't think you're going to be 12 years old for your whole life. I'm not that foolish, but I think that we unnecessarily get a lot older than we have to be. Some people call it reverse aging and so on and so forth. I'm saying, I think you need to do basic things to stay as healthy as you can without being obsessed by it, right? This isn't a biohack. This is about things you can do for yourself. And there's nothing you can, again, I'll repeat, there's nothing you need to buy. There's something you need to know about. And there's some action you need to take on you. So I am selling something here. Right up front, I'm selling something. I am selling you on you. And I hope I am a successful salesperson. So you don't have to lose that much muscle in order to lose control, stability, mobility, sarcopenia. And here's sort of in just a diagram. I get it, and there's some images coming up. 30, 50, 80 years old. I've seen plenty of these, and this is the neatest way to put this up. And here you go. Yes, you lose muscle mass. You could say you peak at 25, this is all about growth hormone, all about IGF, but we're just talking about muscle mass right here. So you peak at 25 in your late 20s, let's say, and from there, it's downhill, so to say. But there's a lot of that downhill that you can mitigate, that you can change and make it not so downhill. But here's how it goes. By the age of 40, if you get less than 70%, so you don't have to lose a lot, you just have to lose less 30% loss. So you have to have less than 70% of your peak when you're 25, to start losing stability. So grandma or grandpa are not really, really weak. They're just 30% less than they were when they're in their 20s. So from ages 40 to 70, you have 8% loss. And after that, uh, you basically lose from ages 40 through 70, you have an 8% loss per year of the previous year. And after age 70, and a per decade muscle loss is 15%. Actually, per decade, it wasn't per year, per decade. So 8%. So it actually accumulates. And this is what you need to step into to mitigate. This is probably the number one thing that you need to do. If you focus on your muscles, and this isn't all going to be about muscles, you will have a better mind, you will have better bones. So less than 70% zone is where the risk of death is high. You don't have to lose that much to have a problem. We can avoid this, but it is necessary for many to be in a wheelchair to be supported. So another way to look at it, look at it is, is circulating IGF levels, the rise and fall. And this is kind of a, a general stereotypic rise and fall profile. It's true, sarcopenia, age-related muscle loss. You can sort of intuit that this is true, right? From a child to an old man or woman. The issue of IGF level is really about one's entire life. The issue about IGF level is really about one's entire life, not just our later years. Okay, here we go. So for IGF, now we're looking at the same profile as we get on the far side of the peak. And this peak is really, again, in your 20s, in your early 20s. So on the other side of the peak, we have an opportunity to decrease premature aging, right? We need to increase it. We need to not let it fall away. And let me tell you, if you go back 100 years ago, there tasks of daily living that they had to do really mitigated this, improve this. This is a modern problem. So the sarcopenia, the osteoporosis, the dementia, the Alzheimer's, they are very modern in terms of the rate of increase on a per capita basis. So what do we have on the other side? Well, we also do have a problem that we also have acquired in the last 70 years. It didn't always exist. And that is precocious puberty. That is little kids 
getting older faster, not getting too old, but suddenly what happened in 18 is now happening at 10 and 12. Why is that? So we have too much too soon and we don't have enough too late. That's the paradigm. We're not gonna get into precocious puberty here. That's a great topic. I'm gonna to push that off to another video down the road because it's multifactorial and it's not just about IGF. But you need to know the context of where these numbers come from. So I have to blind you with some numbers a little bit and blind you with a little academic uh, understanding, instruction if you will, to say what this is about so you have a handle on it for yourself. This isn't, I'm trying to separate you from the need to have an expert in your life to do all this. If you have a little understanding, just like if you were going to the uh, car shop, the uh, garage, the dealership to get your car worked on, you know enough to say, hey, this isn't working, that isn't working. The more you know, the better you can use your mechanic. This is why I'm trying to educate you to better use your doctor, your healthcare practitioner, to understand labs. I think it really comes down to you really need to understand your labs. Not a long line of them, but just some basic ones to have a handle on it. You don't need to be an auto mechanic to know what's wrong with your car to an extent, and this is the analogy I'm using. So what we got is growth hormones. This is real simple. Hypothalamus pituitary, it's in your brain. It's right between the top of your nose and back a little bit. Probably knew that. You learned that in elementary school probably now. We're going to say, we're going to start at the pituitary. That's where growth hormones released. So we hear a lot about growth hormone, growth hormone, growth hormone. We're talking about people who do not have a problem with deficiency or excess. And it was a fairly normal in life. And what has happened to that normal person? So what has happened is this. Your growth hormone hits your liver, hits a few other things as well, but primarily it hits your liver. And my analogy is it's a baseball and your liver catches the growth hormone. It catches the growth hormone and its signal is to produce IGF, insulin-like growth, insulin-like growth factor one, IGF. Okay, it's the IGF we're gonna talk about. The IGF is gonna be in the labs, not the growth hormone. The reasons we don't really measure growth hormone is because it's half-life. The, the amount that it stays stable in your blood is so short, it's a waste of time. So unless you have an emergency and you really need to find out in somebody if growth hormone exists at all, it's really not a worthwhile lab to do. So it's IGF is what we test. So we're gonna be talking about IGF, even though we're at the same time, we're really measuring growth hormone, okay? So IGF, when it growth hormone stimulates your liver, the IGF, it goes and determines your, your fat amount, it determines your muscle strength, it determines your bone consolidation, your bone strength. So there we go, your osteoporosis, your sarcopenia, your obesity or diabetes, if you will, and also to your mind. Where do we get this? Is growth hormone to the liver, the liver, the muscle, bones, and fat efficiency. So simplified diagram of growth hormone, IGF, what we actually measure. I'll say growth hormone from the pituitary. I want to make sure you understand what this is. So we have growth hormone coming down and IGF is a feedback loop, right? When IGF gets overproduced, the pituitary goes, got it, got it, got it, we'll cut back. We, we, we will not do this forever. And so in fact, growth hormone is just released in what they call a pulsatile fashion. In the middle of the night, in the middle of great night's sleep, that's why a great night's sleep is very important. So IGF is made in the liver, but then IGF takes care of a lot of other things as well. Neurodevelopment, thymus, that's your immune system. Thymus is right under your sternum, uh, your kidneys, fetal growth, musculoskeletal, you knew that, and heart muscle ovarian and testicular function. Why this is important, because we're gonna talk about what happens when somebody has too much IGF. How can somebody get too much IGF? I hope you're thinking that. I'm gonna show you how that happens to a lot of people and they get into a lot of trouble. Those troubles primarily come out in the way of prostate cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer. And after that, you can add in liver cancer and you can sort of guess why. If you have a problem with either not getting enough growth hormone because it's not being produced because of lifestyle, then you're gonna have the problems from muscle, nerve, there's your mind, and sex characteristics in terms of ovarian, breast, and prostate. Okay, circulating growth hormone and IGF levels are maximal during puberty, right? So you get over the hump, growth in early childhood, but progressively decline with age. Referred to as somatopause. So it's an analogy to menopause and andropause. Reduced growth hormone IGF ratio, right, in the elderly is responsible for or contribute to many symptoms of aging. Muscle loss, increased adiposity, fat, uh, reduced bone mineral density, osteoporosis, decline in energy levels, alterations in psychological indica indicators of the quality of life, i.e. dementia and possibly Alzheimer's, which is the largest type of of dementia. So growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor is what we are talking about. So it all comes down to growth hormone going to IGF, lab re 
results don't lie. Now I'm going to blind you a little bit looking at some labs. So I promise I won't do this very much, but I think context is important. This is just part of a spreadsheet. If I put any more people, you know, any more of the labs and the spreadsheets on this page, it would just look like a blur of numbers. It already looks like a blur of numbers. I understand that. But my point is, when you look at the context of all these labs, look at the left-hand side over here, so you see all these labs that I take on an individual to give me the context of how is this individual doing. Most of the people that come to me, this is not uh, cheap by any means, but it's meant to be a tool for them to use and reproduce later on in their life so they get a handle on how they can take care of themselves, really. These, aren't, uh, these are basically people that are really interested in wanting to be healthy, but they never had the tools to understand that. It wasn't just say, hey, eat a good diet and do some exercise. They wanted to be more specific. And I believe them, and I am with them in the sense of, you wanna make data-driven decision-making choices in your life, and this is one way. Knowing your labs, allows you to step away from all the marketing hype and all the bio hacking BS that's out there and also the under understood aspect that most doctors offer their patients which is way too little information so that's why I do this it is a whoppingly large this is one of four panels that I do by the way so th from this context I you notice a big red line in the middle I split this page into two people to make it simple because I think it's very important. And what I split it to is insulin resistant people that are on the, on the right side and non-insulin resistant people on the left side. Because as I go in to throw, throw some scatter plots, I'm gonna show you this is from an insulin resistant group or this is from a non-insulin resistant group. And so what do I mean by that? Insulin resistance comes down to this really one definition, HOMA IR. You basically, I'm not going to hit this link, but you hit this link and it basically measures fasting insulin over fasting glucose. So you do a 71, 72, you punch that in and that's going to give you a number of where they are relative to insulin resistance. As I said, this is not insulin resistant side. They're fine, they're healthy. They may be overweight, but they're healthy. Some may be overweight. And these are relatively unhealthy. So when you look at some of the glucose levels, they look kind of normal and then they come, become very bad. You look at the insulin levels and they're basically all bad. The reason I put some in purple because they are bad in my reference range, but in conventional medicine, they are not bad. So I put this down here. So we're, all these people here are not insulin resistant. So they are not uh, HOMA IR. They are low. They're under 1.4, right? And so all these are way over. And so that's how we're going to do it. So these are the two sets of data we're going to be using. So that's what I wanted to show you. And in the middle, this whole talk is about IGF. You know, do you see a pattern from this to that? You go, well, not really, sort of. Well, when I put in probably all 60 people, the pattern becomes very tight. And that's what we're going to look at. Now, you know, we're really talking about IGF and we're putting it in the context of all those other labs. And that's what we're going to be talking about for the rest of all these videos. So it's really IGF we're talking about because this is what we can actually measure in the labs. It has to do with bone strength, has to do with muscle strength, has to do with your ability to burn fat, has to do with helping with uh, blood sugar control, stimulate immune function, it kind of showed you why in that whole little big diagram, support thyroid, most people don't know about that, vitality in general. I said if it was the number one lab you could give me, I will tell you how vital you are, how healthy you are, uh, has to do with sleep and cognition. So here's an example of a scatter plot of all my clients thrown together, and I simply said, okay, from their IGF numbers, right, to this is your thyroid panel. So if you are normal thyroid is around two to, we'll call it two to four, be simple. So right in this range is what we call normal. If you're at five, you're hypothyroid. If you're TSH, it's your thyroid stimulating hormone right over here, which is your beige line. If that is too high, you are hypothyroid. If it's too low, you are hyperthyroid, okay? Now you know that. And T3, free T3 and free T4 are your thyroid hormones. T3 comes from T4. So we throw all this together and what do we say? What do we see? For one is the higher your, your IGF, the higher your IGF, what we find, it drives up your T3. It actually, your T3 is very sensitive. That means it drives up the conversion of your T4 to T3. And as and your T3 is your powerful one. The, the T3 is your really the, the workhorse of your thyroid hormone. Your thyroid stimulating hormone comes from your pituitary. So we're seeing that your T3 starts to skyrocket you know, for those who are really healthy and no one say skyrockets, tends to go up into a healthier range and your TSH consequently decides to start coming down lower and lower. It comes down lower and lower because you have on through all that you're doing for daily activities to make your IGF go up, it makes your thyroid healthier. And so your pituitary backs off. It's less than it has to do. So it drops 
its message. Your TSH will drop. Your T3, free T3, will go up. Your free T4 stays more or less about the same. Okay, so that's general. That's all the people that I did, you know, insulin resistance, non resistance, the whole nine yards, the same kettle of fish, all in one. That's what it looks like. Pretty interesting. I didn't know that before. So what else is IGF-2? Well, let's get real. Skeletal muscle, bones, tendons, joints, and capsules, collagen, cartilage discs, ligament bones, muscle tendons. So all of this, you don't hear that much about for IGF. You hear about, well, muscle bones, so, but it's all about the tendons as well. Very big deal. What's interesting is that ask yourself, why is collagen such a popular supplement today? It's because everybody is borderline hypothyroid, we'll definitely get to that, but they are all for their age group are deficient, very low for IGF. So consequently, they can't produce, they can't support their ligaments and their joints and so on. They get weaker and weaker, let alone their bone and their muscle and everything else. So this is one way the supplement industry is, industry is compensating for the general population being so low in IGF. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying it's a sign that it's compensating for something we don't need compensation for if we're healthier. You wouldn't need it, collagen, if you had sufficient IGF. Chronic diseases of civilization. Too little IGF, you have atrophy. You start to fall apart, right? That's what we think about old age. We have dementia, sarcopenia, osteoporosis, to name a few. When you have too much, you have uncontrolled growth, and that's cancer. That, by definition, is cancer. We have prostate, breast, and colorectal cancer. So often if you get into any sort of conversation with somebody about IGF, they're gonna go, well, too much is cancer. Too little is this. It's like, so what are they gonna do? Well, there's a lot of common sense that we will go through all this with, okay? But there has been this same idea, it's called 40 years of IGF, the Jekyll and Hyde of the aging brain. This is the actual name of a, of a study in a paper, which is pretty interesting, right? They're basically saying too much is a problem, too little is a problem. Where are we? Where's the Goldilocks aspect here? So it's a great concept. And what it says is IGF, neurogenesis, basically making more nerve cells, being you know, neurologically healthy, whether it's brain or nerves. Um, that's why people with people like um, ALS and MS and all sorts of uh, neurological diseases have low IGF. Cell survival, these are just fancy words, the same thing, myelination, more about nerves. But when you have too much, you have so many reactive ROS, reactive oxygen species. You have so much you know, uh, stress resistance. You have no autophagy, which is the breaking down and taking out the garbage and the broken down cells. It just doesn't happen when you have too much, all always on, not pulsatile, but always on. And I'm gonna show you how a lot of people have that situation. So it's a great concept, but it is an oversimplification of what the actual problem is. That was in 2018. I dressed it up a little bit, of course, Mr. Hyde and, and Dr. Jekyll. Here's the required amount is what you want is over here. The required amount is healthy immune function, brain health, decreased dementia, muscle and bones, decreased sarcopenia, decreased osteoporosis, decreased healthy aging. Uncontrolled growth is cancer. It's cancer primarily with prostate, breast, ovarian, and then liver, hepatocellular carcinoma, should you know. Here's from an actual study. It's called the antagonistic pleiotrophy of insulin-like growth factor. Fancy words, right? You can bet there's a few people reading that one. Um, when's the last time you used pleiotrophy in a sentence, right? So it's 2021, and it actually is very clever, and we'll go into it. But what it did, it, it took, this is in the UK. I'll give you the paraphrasing, and we'll get into some of the details. It basically, it took everybody who went into the health system. So they called the UK. UK health system. Everybody who applied UK health system between 2006 and 2010, they got their blood work done and so on and so forth. And they had their IGF and they're saying, all right, IGF relative to their condition that they had when they came in and here's what they have. And they want to see if there was a correlation. So IGF relative to their particular correlation. And uh, you go, well, mortality. How can anybody have a correlation with mortality, with death? Well, what they did is they took the blood work and then they took it with the goal of year integration into the system, which is my guess is about a year or so. And so in the course of that year, you had people who died. So you knew what their blood work was. And they said, hey, all those who died. What I want to point out is see these little dots it's sort of intuitive. A big dot means there's more people behind it, but the collective population is around 500,000. Know, that's a lot of people. So they're saying every little large dot represents 90,000 people. The correlation with, and here's the, what they call the um, R squared, but is the, um, it's very tight. And this is just random up here. So when you look at the R squared number, that shows how tight it is. This is not necessarily number one. So the highest correlation is down here. Highest correlation is osteoporosis. Second highest correlation, we're looking at the R2 number, is diabetes. And then the third highest after that is uh, vascular disease. So there's heart attacks and strokes. 
and then it's dementia, and then it's then it's mortality, and then and so it's low. We'll get into this a little bit. And then cancer. So cancer got weaker and weaker. So this is the IGF on the bottom, same scale on the bottom. So you're saying low, 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 low. We're all associated with these particular conditions. And then cancer was associated, but that was too high. But there was a weak correlation. Notice the dots over there. So questions to ask going forward is this. Is it too much versus too little IGF? Simply, I want more, I'll eat more, I'll make more. Or is it something else? We'll come back to that. So details of the study they used is that UK Biobank is a population-based study for roughly 500,000 individuals from the United Kingdom. That's a lot of people. It provided a baseline measurement, you bet it did, at recruitment from 2006 to 2010 and followed participants prospectively going forward in the future through integration with the national health records. So I don't know, they didn't stipulate how long it takes to be integrated into the national health records, but I'm saying I can't imagine it's uh, any more than a year. At baseline, participants underwent blood draw, phlebotomy, physical measurements, and provided medical history. That's how they got the conditions and demographic information. Pretty cool, huh? So I took that same diagram and I rearranged it from the highest correlation to the lowest correlation. And so we have the same scale, IGF. So we have, it's all about low. Osteoporosis is all about low. Uh, diabetes is all about low. Pretty tight, by the way. Look at that. 0 0.987, 0 0.986. That's like almost 100%. Number three is now 0.94, still very tight. Low, 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 low. Mortality is number four, 0 0.8. I told you about mortality. The dementia, it comes in at points, uh, call it 0.7. And then cancer is too high, but it's a lesser 0.2. So it's it was enough to be correlated. Okay, so I have to show you this. So what I do, I took that spreadsheet and all the, all the ones you couldn't see, but I just opened them up so you got the concept. So I put them all together and I did what they call scatter plots. And scatter plots are what they do in research. They compare two variables, right? And I talked about that in other variables and other uh, videos. And so these are all very associations with IGF. So we're having IGF and pounds overweight. I do pounds overweight instead of BMI, basal metabolic index. I just think it's more real. People tend to think tangibly in pounds overweight. They don't go, oh, my BMI is a little bit high. Nobody says that. And nobody really can relate to that. So I do pounds overweight. Also, it's an easy thing to put into the spreadsheet as a attribute. Okay, so we have IGF pounds overweight. This is IGF, this is interesting. IGF first of just non-insulin resistant people and pounds overweight. Notice how as their weight goes up, their IGF drops and then it levels off. But for insulin resistant people, remember to the right side of the grid, but we'll get into that. We'll get into a lot of these comparisons, but I want you to see that I'm now looking for relationships of various things. Insulin-like growth factor with various other hormones, insulin -like growth factor, linoleic acid, we're gonna get deep into that and so on and so forth and how it looks. That's what we're going to be looking at. Okay, I have to inject a little humor and a little seriousness to show you not every study is truthful. I hope you sort of got that, right? So the problem with using studies only is that they are incomplete. That is, they show you what they want to show you. It's not like they disclose everything. And that's, you know, it's a business model. It's not a science model. It's a business model. Often highly prejudicial and agenda, agenda driven. And this is a quote, a vast majority of scientific work is directed towards serving profits and power rather than applying knowledge to build a better world. Professor Norman Fenton, you can look him up. He's a, a, a bio networker, he's an engineer, a brilliant person, a lot of patents. So on the more humorous side, an important scientific study proves that the result of scientific study depends entirely on where his funding is cover, coming from. So it's both humorous and very serious in terms of, I feel lucky I have enough of my own data. So when I read a study that I go, you know, I'm gonna check that with my data. Does that ring true? And I realize a lot of studies are, are completely bogus and uh, you don't know everything that they're talking about or where their funding's coming from. So that's why I like data so much. It's just clean. You know, it's, I can, nobody can influence the data and uh, I get to see patterns and that's what this is about. What should your level be? Not as straightforward as it appears, by the way. Many labs in many countries use their own reference ranges and they all vary. Oh my gosh. So how do we know what a healthy reference range should be? Let's look at the numbers. I have to explain this a little confusion first that you need to know. Let's start here. How do we measure IGF? So what are the optimal IGF levels? Depend on who you ask. One study conducted in Europe about IGF levels in China, interesting Europe and China, found the following averages in healthy patients of different age ranges. This is actually a breakthrough of uh, well, 2017, that's five years ago, six years ago. They went through all this and what they did is they did age and average serum. They didn't do gender differences. Here's a, you know, 
basically you're in your 20s, you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and one number for that decade. Well, that was better than nothing, but so they're saying basically the range is 85 to 40 for Chinese adults. So the reference range is for serum, IGF, and healthy Chinese adults. Healthy meaning non-pathological, they didn't have deficiencies or excesses. So the conclusion of that though is really what I want to point you to. So in 2017, which is very recent, uh, the normal reference range for age and sex specific serum IGF levels were established for the first time. For the first time, it's in China, but it was pretty much the first time it was groundbreaking in a large sample of Chinese adults. And their conclusion was the number was significantly influenced by age, how old you were, your gender, your BMI, pounds over overweight, and geographic region. That's a big country like the United States, bigger actually. So the reference range is, there's now a variability. You go, oh, wait a minute. There's a uniformity to it in a way, but there's also a variability you have to ask, okay? So example of another reference range is IGF. This is from Quest, the United States now, right? So what they did is male and female, and this is, they've accumulated in their labs throughout the United States, and they put it together. They still have some shortcomings. And the reason I'm gonna sort of box out certain ages, because that's the age of, my wife, and we'll look at this number. So we go, not specific enough, only male, female to age 18. After that, they use the same range for everybody. So after 18, everybody got the same number. I don't buy it. Okay, here's the University of Iowa Healthcare Center. I just use them as an example. Again, they have a slightly different range here. Here's what we just circled. So it's not that different. So let's say 68 year old woman, 55, 54 to 164. The other was 41 to 270. They're kind of like, well, that's kind of like, not very specific. So now we have male, female by age group and standard deviation, that's helpful, but it's the same number. They just basically then measured out all of these is a standard deviation away from that number. Notice male and female, same number, male and female, same number. Jump over here, male and female, same number. So ages one through 85, no gender differences. It's only by age. I don't like that either. So now this is a Salt Lake. I'm not familiar with the labs, but they put it out there. So I use them. Here's 67 year old. They had male and female. So what I like about them, they have gender differences all the way up through, well, as far as I wanted to go, which was, I think they went up to 80. Now we're into LabCorp, which we do use. For this, all my data comes from LabCorp. So they have gender, male low end, male high end. That's pretty cool. Uh, female low end, female high end for every age up until by year, up until 20. After 20, it's by five years. So five year age groups. That's very precise of a high end and low end. So still, as you can guess, it's kind of blinding. We'll come back to that in a second. So age differences now in the US, IGF levels by age, ethnicity, and gender. This is in US adults 2010. And you can see non, not Hispanic white, non Hispanic black, Mexican American. There's different lines. Now we're getting a little more refined in terms of saying, let's take a look at you. The thing about the America, in America, USA, primarily, we're a polyglot. So I have genes from Norway and from Germany, other ethnicities, African, Asian, mixed into our family as well. So we're not. Hispanic white, I guess. And some of us are, well, anyways, they're mixed. So it gets messy is my point. But at least they know there's a difference between gender and there's a difference between ethnicity. And here's another one from Serbia. So now we're outside the United States. What are they doing? I love, I love the bar charts because visually you can jump on it and you can say, well, that's interesting. Males were higher at birth than lower, lower, lower until after 66 in Serbia, which is kind of a, a one culture, more cohesively, genetically similar than in the United States. So we can say something like this. Look pretty interesting. Okay. So now I plotted all of the lab core. I put it in a spray spreadsheet and I made a graph of this that was kind of laborious, but it gave me a visualization and I thought that was really helpful. I converted the data to a graph to be more useful from LabCorp on women. So here's the high level of the women, here's a low level of women, here's the women peak. Uh, isn't that really helpful? Because it's a tool now, I've made it into a tool. Let's go into males. Males, same thing. Males peak a little uh, later, but now I have a high end and a low end and I get to see use this as a tool when men come in. I'm gonna show you how I use this. Now we put them together. You can see kind of nothing you didn't already know or could intuit, but it's really interesting. They're off by a couple of years. So it speaks to the problem of high school, don't you think? <laughs> problem of those high school dances. So putting it together, it looks like this, but now let's use it as a tool. And I, and I put both together, your high and low range. So it's easy to see a larger context visually. Girls do develop faster than boys and now you know why. All right, so how can this be helpful? At a glance, I'm not gonna go deep into this. So three women that I took all their labs on that you saw, but we're just gonna look at IGF here. So we have high normal, high normal, and very low. We 
We have a woman, 47. Um, I had seen her a couple times, so I know that her levels were lower before. She got nicely guided up to what I call high normal. She goes, well, she's out of range. I'm going to not be so, you know, if, if the pattern goes higher and higher and higher, I'll look at something. But she was low before, so there's nothing for me to worry about. Here's another person who is low. Low is 72. Look at, there's the range of women, high and low. She's pretty much out of the range in terms of the bottom. Something is going on. Clearly something was going on, and it was liver-oriented. And now you can see that my guess would be that as much as she's getting growth hormone, her liver can't convert the growth hormone, can't receive the signal and produce the IGF appropriately. And she's suffering the consequences of that. So it's a liver problem. We'll get into that another time. Here's my wife, Judy. She's always had a history of high normal. It's not out of the park and I'm fine with that. So we have high normal, high normal. I think that's where you should be for health and low normal. So see right away, one lab put there, I go, all right. I get to see their vitality score, if you will. Okay, some lab studies just use one number for all adults, ignoring all differences between age, gender, and ethnicity. A one-size-fits-all approach. How American, don't you think? Oh, you go over there. You get the idea. There's not a unified standard reference. You have to look at the context. All right, this study comes out of UCLA. And what they did is they took 14 other studies from around the world, put them in a blender, blended them up and said, well, if you had to choose one number for everybody, this would be the number. Seriously. So what they did, according to the meta study, means they took other people's studies, 14 combined studies, 140 was the key number. And here's their nice diagram saying, hey, well, you know, it means something. 14 studies combined over 30,000 people over 30 years old. Me, I think that's garbage. It's not a one size fits all. It's saying you don't need to look at, at context. Forget about it. Are they, you got 140? They don't got 140. <laughs> Seriously? These are all the study used. It's nice that they use all these from Denmark to Italy to uh, Iran and so on. So now I put my LabCorp graph here and I put that 140 there, who would that benefit? So if you were to look at what is the halfway point for 140, it's probably around here, which for are we women, for women, it would be age group around 66. After that, it's too high. After that, it's too low. I think it's irrelevant. I think it's a stupid way of thinking. And here I put it for men as well. Where would halfway be? Here's 140 at that level. Halfway would be about here. So that again, would be about 61 to 65 would be appropriate number for that age group. As you got older, that number would become less relevant. And if you used it too early at 30, or you should be 140, you should be actually be a lot higher than that. So that's a one size fits all. Why are they doing it? I refer to my previous slide of check the funding. All right, this is bad research. The normal reference range for age and sex-specific serum IGF, and I repeated this before, is significantly influenced by age, sex, BMI, and geographical region. Apparently, that study said, let's forget all that. Let's just put it one size fits all and get on with it. Well, good for them. I think he was probably auditioning for a pharmaceutical company. The question isn't, what is your IGF level, but how is it being generated or how is it being blocked? More on that coming, you can bet. So to know that, we have to explore it further. And here's the plan in doing that in other videos, but I'm gonna give you a brief outline on it. So here's what have been covered in other videos. A video on dairy, IGF, pasteurization, refrigeration, and the history thereof. Thyroid, we'll get to it in a second. There's been a 400% increase in hyperthyroidism in the last 30 years. That's amazing, ever. In the last 30 years compared to antiquity. HIV, high intensity training, and protein, leucine, muscle protein synthesis, CGM, which is continual glucose monitors, glucose spike, we'll get into that. So what really affects your IGF? Obesity, how does that affect IGF? Linolenic acid, how does that affect your IGF? Sauna, how does that affect your IGF? Dietary blocks to IGF, you never knew were a problem. The effects of stress in IGF. All right, so briefly, and dairy, I'm just whipping through this. I'm gonna give you a verbal, we're not going into it. So dairy, so we're gonna start here. The collective concern is just about dairy now. We're gonna pretend the world is full of healthy cows. So it's a time on timeline of dairy. When did we actually start drinking milk? When did we actually start using dairy? First we drank milk, then we made cheese, and then we went crazy, right? So the timeline is we really just started about 6,000 years ago. That's after the beginning of what they call the agricultural uh, revolution, which is about 10,000 years ago in the Middle East, and I did a number of videos on that. By the way, there wasn't any refrigeration. So two things, we started using cow's milk, drinking a nut, so we're, we're talking about milk, but we're also talking about a different species, using a different species of milk for our own use. That started 6,000 years ago. We started drinking alcohol, making beer, making beer with recipes 14,000 years ago. We started making wine 7,000 years ago. So you can say we are more genetically adapted to handle alcohol than we are to handle dairy. 
We'll go into that, but so it's a head word. You had things like casomorphines, which come from dairy, is a more potent opioid than morphine itself and is responsible for most of the typical behavioral and cognitive symptoms of autism. That's a strong reference and I'll reference where I got that from. Casomorphines ultimately causes brain damage like morphines. Hmm, whoa. The difference between beta casein A1 and A2, we'll talk about it. Now the tipping point. So all that is in a healthy cow. That's just talking about dairy as if cows are grazing grass and you just happen to go up and milk them and make your cheese from that. Well, nobody does that really, um, or very rarely, and we'll get into that too. The tipping point came when why dairy consumption is now associated with growth hormone and IGF and various cancers, prostate, breast, colorectal, etc. cetera. Uh, US commercial versus organic dairy, bovine growth hormone, bovine IGF, and antibiotics, increase mTOR and IGF, refrigeration, dairies and everything today per capita consumption has skyrocketed even though our drinking of milk has gone down. Per capita has increased, milk consumption decreased, cheese consumption way up baby, and then all the additives to all the other foods. So dairy and cancer, we'll end on that. So that's dairy, the video coming up. Linolenic acid, that's that's a plant base, it's natural. So this is no chemical. A linoleic acid, it comes from plants. Primarily it comes from grains. And you've heard about vegetable oils. The whole last 70 years was, hey, let's have omega-6 instead of saturated fats. Started under Ansel Keys in the 60s, done a lot of videos on that, on linoleic acid and Ansel Keys and so on and so forth. But it's a plant, omega-6, you take in, your body can convert some of it to omega-3, but not much. And here what we're saying, linoleic acid, linoleic acid, otherwise known as plant omega-6, has devastating effects on, for non-insulin people, here's linoleic, this is as their amount, this is from my labs, remember, these are my labs, as linoleic acid goes up for non-insulin resistant people, their IGF rises and then falls. And this is kind of a stress response. It tries to mount a response and it gets to be too much and it just falls. For those who are already insulin resistant, right? They already have high insulin, they already have high glucose levels. There, when they start increasing their linoleic acid, it's just another weight on their shoulders and it immediately drops their IGF slower and lower and lower. And you can bet that affects their immune system. You can bet, bet that affects a lot of other things. Thyroid, linoleic acid suppresses thyroid signaling. Here is your thyroid TSH. I told you, said this uh, briefly before. As your linoleic acid increases, your thyroid stimulating hormone drives you further and further up to a hypothyroid. Okay, so this is TSH. I just threw this in. Omega-3 drives it down the other side. Something you can do. We'll get to that. Uh, IGF and omega, just a linoleic acid and IGF. It drops your IGF like a stone. Okay, obesity. So this is for the insulin resistance. This is insulin resistance right here. You have pounds overweight, right? So pounds over, if people start getting pounds overweight, this is for all people. You can see eventually they're they become more and more insulin resistance. It's pretty, straight, pretty straightforward. Pounds overweight versus HOMA IR. We'll get into that. The prevalence of obesity in the US, of course, has increased from 1990 to 2010. That's 30 years. It's increased almost 100%. That's 75% in 30 years. So relative to pounds overweight, as we're getting heavier and heavier, I didn't break it down, but I will later in the video, of IGF gets lower and lower and lower. So pounds overweight ends up being a weight on your shoulders and it sinks your IGF, and has, which has other consequences. HIT and protein has a lot to do with sarcopenia. So we're gonna talk about leucine, leucine MPS, uh, the pulsatile fashion, glucose spikes, apex carnivore, and the frequency of IGF. This is just me from a couple of years ago saying, when you do high intensity weight resistance training, you will spike your glucose, which initiates a growth hormone release. So it's a way you can get in and help yourself. This is simply muscle protein synthesis. This is the average person. They have more, as you get older, you have more muscle breakdown, right? This is protein. And so we don't eat enough protein. So this is just on, uh, we break down more. So we said, this is muscle protein building up and this is muscle protein breaking down. You can see it dips down further than it builds up. We are breaking down more and more muscle. So we become sarcopenic as we get older in time on a daily basis, simply because we're not eating enough protein. We eat more protein, we can at least even that out. At least we can stop the breakdown. We can stop the sarcopenia. If we add in exercise, specifically, we add in HIT, you can increase your MPS. There you go. We're gonna get into details about that. The effects of stress. Stress is huge. Stress 
drives up cortisol, drives up glucagon, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to get deep into this, but here's what I said, the effects of stress and IGF. It's not what happens to you, but how you respond to what happens to you. You have three stages. You defend yourself against stress, and the stress could be financial relationship, uh, physical. It could be the bears chasing you in the woods. But that's acute stress versus chronic stress, and that's the difference. What happens when you've gone too far? How to use good stress to increase your IGF? We're going to talk about this. And this is how we measure cortisol in people. Some people are just burnt out. They can't make any more cortisol. They've been under chronic stress for whatever reason. Work relationship, having responsibilities to kids and families and so on and so forth, it wears them down and they fall apart. So here we go, three stages of stress, defends, copes and fatigues, and it's also other references to that. We're gonna get going deep into that. Dietary blocks and nutrient supports to IGF. I mentioned omega-3, IGF and vitamin D, that's an interesting relationship. Folate, did you know that folate actually can get in the way and de decrease your IGF? Glucose, you could sort of guess that, high glucose, decreases your IGF. Anion gap, if you know what that is, that's, we'll get into that. Stress, which is glucagon. So as your glucagon goes up because of stress, your IGF falls. And here's your insulin resistance and IGF. As your insulin resistance goes up, your IGF goes down and so on. So we will talk about that. Sauna is really interesting. Sauna can, the higher the baseline cortisol level, the greater the decrease in cortisol concentrations after sauna. It can lower your cortisol, and therefore increase your glucagon, therefore increase your IGF. All right, this came from sunbathing is inversely associated with dementia and Alzheimer's in middle age Finnish men. That's 2017. That's pretty cool. Here's your link if you want to chase that. Uh, conclusion is moderate to high frequency of sauna bathing was associated with lowered risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Till next time. Got a lot to cover. So if this is something that you're interested in, that is a topic that I obviously go deeper in, in terms of labs, in terms of how to do it, in terms of why you would want to do it, various topics, as you've seen that I've done in the past, then please let me know below in a comment. Till then.